Good afternoon, and thanks so much for tuning in to our midweek Bible study here at Shehalem Christian Fellowship. We're going to be picking up in the Old Testament right where we left off, excuse me, in Jeremiah chapter 11. So if you have your Bible with you, I just encourage you to turn there and follow along with us as we get started. Of course, we'd invite you to join us as well in person. We're going to be meeting at 6.30 p.m. today on Wednesday, just like we do every Wednesday out at the West Shehalem Friends Church, where uh, we continue just going verse by th verse through the Old Testament, the same study from Jeremiah chapter 11. But we're able also to worship together in song, to pray together. We also have our mid uh, middle school and high school Bible studies happening at the same time. So it's been a great time of fellowship. So do in invite you to come out and join us in person. But if you couldn't, if you can't make it, I'm really glad you're here to listen in on the, the study of Jeremiah chapter 11 today. Of course, <clears throat> you can also join us on Fridays at 4 p.m. for our live stream of our New Testament study. We're going to be picking up in the book of Acts this week. It'll be Acts chapter 8. Same message that's given out uh, on Sunday morning at our Sunday morning service at 10 a.m. We're going to be meeting this week at 14141 Northeast Cooney Road. Do invite you to come out there and join us as we worship together in song and the reading of scripture and the taking of communion together in prayer and fellowship. Wonderful time. The Lord always faithful to meet us as we gather together in his name. So do invite you to come along with us. Uh, but if, if you can't make it out there, do join us at Friday at 4 p.m. for our live stream of Acts chapter 8. But for today, again, Jeremiah chapter 11, we invite you to turn there as we get started. David, in the Psalms, in Psalm 119, verses 85 and 86, David said, The proud have dug pits for me, which is not according to your law. All your commandments are faithful. They persecute me wrongfully. Help me. Help me, David said. They persecute me wrongfully. Psalm chapter 119, verses 85 and 86. You know, David was a man that was used to persecution, perhaps not like the kind of persecution we think of, but he spent many years running and hiding from an enraged and deranged king, King Saul. There was many, there were many who threatened, who deceived, who betrayed him, even his own son, Absalom. David was no stranger to persecution, and he prayed, they persecute me wrongfully, help me. You see, I know, I, I believe he, he recognized his need for help because intimidation is, is, it's so tempting to let intimidation push us off course. He wanted help, I believe, from the persecution for protection, but also help to continue to walk in God's ways. He knew he needed to trust in the Lord and the Lord, and the Lord alone to avenge him. You know, I can't say I completely relate with persecution, at least not in the way that David experienced it, and certainly not in the way that Stephen experienced it, as we've been reading in Acts chapter 7, where Stephen there <clears throat> preaching boldly to those who opposed him, to those who would eventually murder him. I can't say I can relate to that kind of persecution. No pits have been dug for me. No literal stones have been thrown at me. But, but I believe, just like you, many of us have experienced harsh words, entrapping words, people trying to, to trap us in what we say in different contexts in different ways. For me, it's interesting, even in the secular world, in the corporate life, where I spent the last 20 years uh, working uh, at, at a large corporation, it was interesting to me in, in the different jobs that I, I held there, how, how, the, how things would interact differently with people. I, I started in the field, working as a technician on construction sites. I eventually worked into project management, into engineering, and then in eventually engineering management. And at all steps along the way, there are different people at different times who work against you and who oppose you for different reasons. In my last job, it was interesting. Uh, my company made a shift in the COVID era. I started working from home remotely. And then eventually, as the company decided to start doing things in different ways, I was actually charged with having to lay off my entire engineering team. And boy, that was not a fun time. Not only did I have to lay them off, but I was also being laid off. My job was going away. There was no engineering group anymore. But luckily, the Lord blessed me at that time. I was able to take a job. But the job that was available to me, while it was a great job, it was working for the corporate 
office, the suit and ties, you know, uh, ironic because I certainly was not wearing a suit and tie very often. Uh, most of the time in a hoodie uh, and, and uh, uh, a ball cap or whatever I had on and, and uh, basically pajamas because <laughs> I was working remotely here from Newburgh. <clears throat> Excuse me. But, you know, it was interesting because having worked in the field for so long, the corporate office, they were the enemy. They were the ones making rules and they didn't understand our day to day work. They didn't understand us. But here I am now going to work for the corporate office. And I remember you know, the email chains, the meetings that I would get into and how uh, people would, uh, would, would really fight against what we had to say and fight against what we were doing. And, and uh, you know, the company had objectives, the company had things that they were doing, and I had to support that and work through that. And uh, people certainly, I didn't become a very popular person. Uh, in fact, you know, email chains would, would fly. I'd get called names. I'd be told I didn't understand. I would, uh, my boss would get copied and then my boss's boss and then my boss's boss's boss and email chains would get escalated and, and words would get harsh. And it was really tough to not let that kind of pressure veer me off course to, to not keeping to the things that I was supposed to be doing for the company. And this is just in a secular world. How much more important the things of the word, the things of the Lord, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, how easily we can be pushed off track when, when things get tough, when pressure uh, rises and, and when words get heated. And I think that's why David said, Lord, they persecute me wrongfully. Lord, help me. And Lord, we ask that you would help us. Lord, against the pressure we feel, Help us not to get off track. Lord, help us to follow you in all of our ways. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Before we jump into Jeremiah 11, I want to remind you of something that Paul told us in the book of Romans. In Romans chapter 12, verses 17 through 19, Paul said, Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, Live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. As it is written, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will repay. Repay no one evil for evil, Paul told us. Romans chapter 12, verse 17 through 19. And as I was talking about certain experiences in my life that you've probably experienced in different ways and at various times in your life, it is really tempting to return insult for insult and in injury for injury. But the Lord encourages us, repay no one evil for evil. It, it, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. And I mention this because we're going to get in here to Jeremiah chapter 11, and we're going to start seeing that the prophet, as he faithfully spoke God's word, his words were not received with joy. And people began to persecute him. But before we get there, I do want to take a quick journey through the first part of the book to, sh to see where we've been at so far. And if you'll look at with me chapter one, <clears throat> I just want to show us uh, e each section of, that we've been through along the way. In Jeremiah chapter one, we saw the prophet was called. The prophet was called. The Lord com commanded Jeremiah in chapter one to speak every word that the Lord put in his mouth and to speak it without fear. You see that here in chapter one, verses seven and eight. It says, the Lord said to me, do not say I am a youth, for you shall go to all whom I send you and whatever I speak, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of their faces for I am with you to deliver you. So in Jeremiah chapter one, the prophet is called and then Jeremiah chapter 2, in chapter 2 through chapter 3, verse 5, we saw a pestilent exchange. You see, Jer uh, Jerusalem had left their first love, and they exchanged, in verse 13 of chapter 2, they exchanged the fountain of living waters for cisterns, broken cisterns, that can hold no water. They exchanged truth for a lie. The people left their first love, a pestilent exchange in chapters two through chapter three, verse five. Then we picked up in chapter three, verse six, and from chapter three, verse six, all the way to chapter six, we see a pretense 
of worship, uh, uh, pretense of worship. You see, it was the days of Josiah, and we learned and we re were reminded that there was a great revival in the land in the days of Josiah. But the people, the backsliding people, they weren't returning to the Lord in truth. We see it here in verse 10 of chapter 3. It says there, the Lord says, Yet for all this, her treacherous sister Judah has not turned to me with her whole heart, but in pretense. You see, the Lord knew their heart, and they had not truly returned to the Lord. So we saw the prophet was called. We saw a pestilent exchange, the people leaving their first love. We see here in chapter 3, verse 6, all the way through chapter 6, a pretense of worship. And in this section we just left off and finished up a couple weeks ago, in chapter 7 through chapter 10, a precarious trust. That is, those who trusted in the temple, it says in chapter 7 as it begins. Jeremiah is speaking to those who trusted in the temple, and he warned them to truly and, a, and to thoroughly amend their ways. We see it there in verse 5. If you thoroughly amend your ways and your doings. This was a precarious trust all the way from chapter 7 through chapter 10. And we left off in chapter 10, finishing with a call to be separate, to come out and be separate, to not give ourselves to idolatry, but to recognize the true and living God, that there's none like him, as it says in chapter 10, verse 6, inasmuch as there is none like you, Lord, you are great and your name is great in might. And so with that, we pick up now in chapter 11 as persecution begins against Jeremiah as he continually seeks to speak God's word faithfully. So we pick up here in verse 1 of chapter 11. We're going to read verse 1 through verse 10. It says here, The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Hear the words of this covenant, and speak to the men of Judah, and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and say to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Cursed is the man who does not obey the words of this covenant which I commanded your fathers in the day I brought them out of the land of Egypt from the iron furnace, saying, Obey my voice and do according to all that I command you. So shall you be my people, and I will be your God, that I may establish the oath which I have sworn to your fathers to give them a land flowing with milk and honey, as it is this day. And I answered and said, So be it, Lord. Then the Lord said to me, <clears throat> Proclaim all these words in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem, saying, Hear the words of this covenant and do them. For I earnestly exhorted your fathers in the day I brought them out of the land of Egypt until this day, rising early and exhorting them, saying, Obey my voice. Yet they did not obey or incline their ear, but everyone followed the dictates of his own evil heart. Therefore, I will bring upon them all the words of this covenant, which I commanded them to do, but which they have not done. And the Lord said to me, A conspiracy has been found among the men of Judah and among the inhabitants of Jerusalem. They have turned back to the iniquities of their forefathers who refused to hear my words, and they have gone after other gods to serve them. The house of Israel and the house of Judah have broken my covenant, which I made with their fathers. So verses 1 through 10, a reminder here, a reminder of the covenant. The Lord exhorting Jeremiah to remind the people of his covenant, a covenant which hinged on their obedience to him, a covenant which they repeatedly broke. And he says there in verse 3, cursed is the man. Cursed is the man, verse 3, who does not obey the words of this covenant. Now this would not have been new news. To the people. This is reflective of Deuteronomy chapter 27, verse 26. You remember in that chapter, the blessings and the curses laid out for the people. Blessings if they follow the Lord, if they follow the word. Curses if they didn't. And in, Jer uh, excuse me, in Deuteronomy chapter 27, verse 26, the Lord through Moses says, Cursed is the one who does not confirm all the words of this law by observing them. Again, Deuteronomy 27, verse 26. And the Lord, through Jeremiah, recalling the fact that disobedience brings a curse upon the people. 
Now, this curse is still in effect to any who continue under the law. That is, anyone who attempts to be made right with God by keeping the law. If you'll turn with me to Galatians, Galatians chapter 3, verse 10, we'll pick up there as Paul reminds us of the curse of, of, of trying to be made right with God through the keeping of the law. Galatians chapter 3, verse 10. He says there, Galatians 3, 10, As many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. Yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. You see, in trying to make ourselves right before God by obeying the law, we are actually bringing a curse upon ourselves because we cannot pick and choose which laws to keep. We must keep it all, he says. And newsflash, you will fail if you try. But Christ, verse 13 Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So Christ became a curse for us, releasing us from the law. And now this redemption that we have in Christ, it doesn't preclude the call to hear and to obey. In fact, I believe it amplifies it. We're called as his children and called to imitate him, to love him with our whole heart, our whole mind, and our whole soul. And as Jeremiah tells the people in chapter 11, in verse 6, he says, proclaim all these words, hear the words of this covenant, and do them, and do them. Just as as Moses said in Deuteronomy, cursed is the one who does not confirm all the words of this law by observing them. You see, we are released from the law. We are released from the curse of the law, the, the capital C curse of the law. Christ has redeemed us, but we're still called to obey. We're still called to listen, to be doers of the word and not hearers only. See, our freedom in Christ is not so that we can indulge the flesh. We are made right with God solely because of the work of Jesus Christ. And still, as children of God, we are called to be imitators of Him, to walk in love, to walk as children of light, as the Scripture tells us, and, and as James tells us in James chapter 1, verses 22 through 25, to be doers of the law and not hearers only, deceiving ourselves. He says there in James chapter 1, at the end of that section, in verse 25, he says, He who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. A blessing, not a curse, but a blessing. But if we refuse to listen, if we refuse to hear, if we refuse to obey, what we're left with Verse 8, just like the people, what we're left with is following the dictates of our own evil hearts. We know how that works out, don't we? Following our own hearts. If you look at, at the book of Judges with me, I'm sure you remember the book of Judges and that cycle of sin that they, that they experienced there as they walked in their own ways. Look at Judges chapter 2 great summary statement of the entire book, really. In Judges chapter 2, verse 11, it says, The children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and they served the Baals. Then verse 14, in verse 14, it says, The anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, so he delivered them into the hands of the plunderers who despoiled them. And in verse 16, nevertheless, the, ro- the Lord raised up judges to deliver them out of the hand of those who plundered them. 
So you see this cycle, the children of Israel doing evil in the sight of the Lord. Then the anger of the Lord being kindled, and he delivers them into the hands of their enemies. But then he raises up judges to save them as the people turn back to the Lord. But then the cycle continues, verse 19 of chapter 2, it comes to pass. When the judge was dead, that they reverted, and they behaved more corruptly than their fathers by following other gods to serve them and bow down to them. They did not cease from their own doings and their own stubborn ways, following the dictates of their own heart. And the end of the book of Judges, if you'll turn to chapter 21, verse 25, the summary, another summary statement of the book, as it ends, it says in verse 25, the last verse of the book of Judges, in those days there was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And oh, if you've read the book of Judges, you know how horrible it gets when we just do what's right in our own eyes, when we follow, as Jeremiah warned, the dictates of our own evil hearts. You know, we have that same danger today. In Hebrews chapter 2, we're warned by the author of Hebrews there. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1. The author of Hebrews says, We must give the more, more earnest heed to the things that we've heard, lest we drift away. We need to be careful. And he continues. In chapter 3, verse 10, and he says, quoting from the Old Testament, he says, I was angry with that generation. And I said, they always go astray in their heart. And then in verse 12, beware. Beware, brethren. Speaking to, the, to the, the people of his day, speaking to us through the Holy Spirit. Beware, lest there be any of you with an evil heart of unbelief departing from the living God. Be careful. Be careful lest our hearts be deceived and lest we follow the dictates of our own hearts. And then in chapter 13, the last verse from Hebrews that I'll read, it says in verse 9, again a warning, do not be carried about with various and strange doctrines. For it is good that the heart be established by grace. It is good for the heart to be established by grace. We need to be careful not to follow the dictates of our own evil hearts, but to establish our hearts as the writer of Hebrews encourages us. So we must give the more earnest heed. We must give the more earnest heed to the gospel and to a life lived in light of the gospel, guided by his precious word not following the dictates of our own evil hearts, but verse 8, he says, the Lord says through Jeremiah, I will bring upon them all the words of this covenant, which I commanded them to do, but which they have not done. You see, God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. But it is God who will do this work. It is not our job to repay. He is wise. He is merciful. He is slow to anger. He is full of truth, full of grace, full of love, and full of justice. So let's let him do his job. As Paul told us in Romans chapter 12, as we began our study today, repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. And if it is possible, so much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Well, verses 1 through 10 here of chapter 11, a reminder of the covenant, a covenant which hinged on obedience, a covenant which was repeatedly broken. And we continue on in verse 11. It says there, Therefore, thus says the Lord, behold, I will surely bring calamity on them, which they will not be able to escape. And though they cry out to me, I will not listen to them. Then the cities of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem will go and cry out to the gods to whom they offer incense, but they will not be able to save them at all in the time of their trouble. 
For according to the number of your cities were your gods, O Judah, and according to the number of the streets of Jerusalem, you have set up altars to that shameful thing, altars to burn incense to Baal. So do not pray for this people or lift up a cry or a prayer for them, for I will not hear them in the time that they cry out to me because of their trouble. What has my beloved to do in my house, having done lewd deeds with many? And the holy flesh has passed from you. When you do evil, then you rejoice. The Lord called your name, green olive tree, lovely and of good fruit. With the noise of a great tumult, he has kindled fire on it, and its branches are broken. For the Lord of hosts who planted you has pronounced doom against you for the evil of the house of Israel and of the house of Judah, which they have done against themselves to provoke me to anger in offering incense to Baal. We have here a certainty of calamity, the Lord promising inescapable calamity because of the people's idolatry. There in verse 11, he says, I will surely bring calamity. I will surely bring it. You know, just as when in the book of Judges, the Lord would bring nations against the people, so the Lord here says he is going to bring calamity. Isaiah chapter 45, verse 7, the Lord says through Isaiah, I form light and create darkness. I make peace and create calamity. I, the Lord, do all these things. While this may seem like a contradiction to some, that a loving God would not just allow calamity, allow bad things to happen, but it says he's the author of it. He creates it. Yet we know that his ways are not our ways. We have the entire story. So we can understand. If you look at Jeremiah chapter 29, I believe this will help. It helps me to know where the Lord's heart is. Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 10 and 11. Jeremiah says, the Lord says through Jeremiah, thus says the Lord, after 70 years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you and cause you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. To give you a future and a hope. So when things don't look good, when we don't understand why things are happening, we can understand that God's heart, as he says, is, a, is, is, is his thoughts that he thinks towards us are thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you a future and a hope, but this process, a necessary process right now, this people is not ready. For in verse 11, it says, though they cry, I will not listen. Not because he's callous, not because he doesn't care, but because they're not ready to cry out to him, to only cry out to him. Eventually they will, and he will be ready. As we're told in Deuteronomy, Chapter 4, verses 25 through 31. There, the Lord predicted this time. Again, this isn't new news to the people. Jeremiah is simply reminding them. through, through The Lord is reminding them through Jeremiah. If you look at Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 25, it says, When you beget children and grandchildren and have grown old in the land and act corruptly and make a carved image in the form of anything and do evil in the sight of the Lord your God to provoke him to anger, I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day, Moses said, that you will soon utterly perish from the land which you crossed over the Jordan to possess. You will not prolong your days in it, but you will be utterly destroyed. And this is exactly what we're seeing in Jeremiah's day. The people were provoking him to anger. They were making carved images. They were doing evil on the side of the Lord. So they were fulfilling this word. And the Lord, verse 27, will scatter you among the peoples and you will be left few in number among the nations where the Lord will drive you. 
and there you will serve gods, the work of men's hands, wood and stone, which neither see nor eat, hear nor eat or smell. But from there you will seek the Lord your God, and you will find him if you seek him with all your heart and with all your soul. When you are in distress and all these things have come upon you in the latter days, when you turn to the Lord your God and obey his voice, for the Lord your God is a merciful God, he will not forsake you nor destroy you nor forget the covenant of your fathers, which he swore to them. Eventually they will hear. Eventually they will be ready. Eventually they will call on him with all of their heart and with all of their soul. But for now, he doesn't listen because, verse 12 of Jeremiah chapter 11, they're not ready to seek him with their whole heart. It says in verse 12, they will go and they will cry out to the gods to whom they offer incense. You see, they were just tacking God, the Lord God, onto the, their list of many gods who they would try. You see, the Lord requires exclusivity. He is not one of many ways. He's not one of many gods. He's not one of many things that you just try when you're in a pickle. As Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You see, there's always, always, ever only been one way to be saved, only one way to come to God, and it's through the cross. We look back at it in time. We look back to the cross. They, they looked forward, and both of us see through a glass dimly. But in order to come to God, we must put down our own righteousness and submit to his. We must come to him in faith apart from works, just as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him as righteousness. So too, this people, they must be willing to submit. They must be willing to humble themselves and submit to God's righteousness, to receive him through faith and that faith to be counted to them for righteousness. But, but for now, Verse 14, he says he will not hear them. He will not hear them. But he calls them, and I love this, he calls them in verse 15, he says, my beloved. What is my beloved to do in my house? He still is expressing his love. He still remains faithful. He could have chosen many other words to describe them. We'll see again in chapter 12, just in another page. He'll call them the dearly beloved of my soul. And you can see here his mercy the pain which the rebellion caused him. Because for now, verse 17, he says, they have provoked me to anger in offering incense to Baal. But just as a reminder, the Lord is slow to anger, slow to anger. Psalm chapter 103 <clears throat> there in verse 8, Psalm chapter 103, a psalm of David. Verse 8, he says, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in mercy. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dwelt with, dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. He is patient. He is slow to anger. And how much more so should we be? Can we have righteous anger too? Maybe, but I'm going to go out on a limb and say that our anger is probably very, very, very rarely righteous. It is best to leave that to the Lord whose anger is never spontaneous. It's never impulsive or out of control, always in context of his perfect love and always accompanied by his thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give a future and hope. But for us, let us repay no one evil for evil. Let us have regard for good things in the sight of all men. And if it is possible, 
as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. Give place to wrath. It's not our wrath. The wrath of man isn't productive. Give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. So we have here in Jeremiah chapter 11, verses 1 through 10, a reminder of the covenant. Then we had in verses 11 through 17, the certainty of calamity, the Lord promising inescapable calamity because of the people's idolatry. And we pick up now in verse 18, and we'll read to the end of the chapter, where it says, The Lord gave me knowledge of it, and I know it, for you showed me their doings. But I was like a docile lamb brought to the slaughter, and I did not know that they had devised schemes against me, saying, Let us destroy the tree with its fruit, and let us cut him off from the land of the living, that his name may be remembered no more. But, O Lord of hosts, you who judge righteously, testing the mind and the heart, let me see your vengeance on them, for to you I have revealed my cause. Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the men of Anathoth who seek your life, saying, Do not prophesy in the name of the Lord, lest you die by our hand. Therefore, Thus says the Lord of hosts, behold, I will punish them. The young man shall die, excuse me, the young men shall die by the sword. Their sons and their daughters shall die by famine. And there shall be no remnant of them. For I will bring catastrophe on the men of Anathoth, even the year of their punishment. So verses 18 through 23 here, a failed conspiracy. Jeremiah warned by the Lord of conspiracy against him, and so trusting in the Lord to protect him and to punish those who seek his life. Verse 18, the Lord gave me knowledge of it. He showed me. You know, Proverbs chapter 21, verse 30 says, there's no wisdom or counsel or understanding against the Lord. He is all-knowing. He is wise, and he is able to give wisdom and knowledge Just a couple books to the right in the book of Daniel. We'll get there, I'm sure, in just a couple weeks. Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2, verse 22. You remember here, Nebuchadnezzar had had a dream. And he was very troubled by the dream. And he wanted the dream interpreted. So he called all the wise men and 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 the, the, the magicians and sorcerers and people that, that would, that he thought could help him. But he didn't want to tell them the dream because he didn't, he suspected that they would just lie to him. So he said, you tell me what I dreamed and the interpretation of it. And he threatened to kill them all if they couldn't do it. And Daniel prayed and asked the Lord to reveal the secret. And the Lord does. And Daniel thanks the Lord. In Daniel chapter 2, verse 22, he says, he, the Lord, reveals deep and secret things. He knows what is in the darkness, and light dwells with him. Are you troubled by anything? He knows. He knows what is in the darkness, and light dwells with him. Seek him. In verse 28, Daniel says to Nebuchadnezzar, there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dream and the visions of your head upon your bed were these. And then he continues to tell Nebuchadnezzar about his dream. But he says in verse 30, As for me, this secret has not been revealed to me because I have more wisdom than anyone living. But for our sakes, who made known the interpretation to the king and that you may know the thoughts of your heart. You see, the Lord gives knowledge. The Lord gives wisdom. And that not because of us, Daniel recognized. It wasn't because of me. And sometimes even, I believe, it's in spite of us. And Jeremiah, just like Daniel, took a posture of humility. Verse 19 of chapter 11 of of Jeremiah, he was like, it says, a docile lamb. I was like a docile lamb. That is gentle. Gentle. Gentleness ought to be a defining characteristic of a spirit-filled Christian. Let your gentleness be known to man. The Lord is at hand. 
Paul told us in Philippians chapter 4, verse 5, let your gentleness be known to all men. Galatians 5, of course, the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and gentleness and self-control. Gentleness ought to be one of the defining characteristics of a Spirit-filled Christian. Jeremiah had been given so much revelation by the Lord, and we too, we have the entire scriptures at our fingertips. And the veil, Paul tells us, is taken away in Christ. And as we read the scriptures with that lens, we can know him. And just as we've read just a couple chapters ago in Jeremiah chapter 9, we can glory in the knowledge of God. But lest our heads get too big, 1 Corinthians, don't forget, in chapter 8, 1 Corinthians, Paul tells us in verse 1 of chapter 8, he says, We know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. And if anyone thinks that he knows anything, he knows nothing, yet as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, this one is known by him. Again, knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. So with such knowledge as we have, let us be gentle like Daniel, like Jeremiah, and understand that the knowledge, any knowledge that we do have is not because we are so smart or so wise, but rather because the Lord has revealed it to us. So let us rather love to edify and let God do his job because he is much better suited to do his job. Just as Jeremiah here trusted the Lord in verse 20 of chapter 11, O Lord of hosts, you who judge righteously, testing the mind and the heart, let me see your vengeance on them, for to you I have revealed my cause. It's a natural response. And in contrast to Stephen that we've been reading about in Acts chapter 7, Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 7, verse 60, says he kneeled down and he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this. And, he, and when he had said this, he fell asleep. They were throwing rocks at him. They were murdering him. And he cried out, not like Jeremiah, who said, let me see your vengeance. No, Stephen cried out and said, Lord, forgive them. Don't charge them with this sin, just as his Lord cried out on the cross. Forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. You know, both mindsets, both words are exemplified in Scripture, and they can coexist. But either way, verse 23, I will, the Lord will, bring catastrophe on the men of Anathoth. He will avenge Jeremiah. Vengeance is his, so repay no one for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. And if it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Well, here in Jeremiah chapter 11, verses 1 through 10, a reminder of the covenant a covenant which hinged on obedience, a covenant which was repeatedly broken. Verses 11 through 17, a certainty of calamity, the Lord promising inescapable calamity because of the people's idolatry. Then, at the end of the chapter, verses 18 through 23, a failed conspiracy. Jeremiah warned by the Lord of, an, of a conspiracy that was against him, and he trusted in the Lord to protect him and to punish those who sought his life. Just like David in Psalm chapter 119, verses 85 and 86, as we began our study, the proud have dug pits for me, which is not according to your law. All your commandments are faithful. They persecute me wrongfully. Help me. Help me. Oh, how we ought to be those who live by his word, even in the midst of wrongful persecution. And instead of taking matters into our own hands, being imitators of God as beloved children, walking in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God, 
for a sweet smelling aroma. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your word. Lord, thank you for, for revealing yourself to us. Lord, for giving us knowledge. But Lord, let that knowledge never puff us up. Lord, let us love instead. Because as your word says, knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. Lord, and, and those of us who know something, don't know anything as we ought to know, Lord, we recognize that it's only your spirit. So Lord, help us to live peaceably. Lord, to give place to wrath. Lord, to trust in you and you alone. We give you our lives. We commit ourselves back to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Again, would love to have you join us out 6.30 p.m. out at West Shehalem Friends Church to join us for our Bible study today. Also, uh, this weekend for our, our Sunday service, Sunday at 10 a.m. at 14141 Northeast Cooney Road. But until then, may the Lord bless you. May he keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you. May he be gracious to you and give you peace. In Jesus' name, God bless you.